You are welcome in this place. Your God loves you. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've seen, whatever has happened to you, your God loves you. And He appreciates your song. He welcomes you to this place where He offers to you His very Son, given your behalf. And that doesn't matter what you've done. There, there's nothing about worthy that makes you worthy to be here. Your worthiness is ascribed to you. He says you're worth it. He says you're worth it. So whoever you are, whatever you've done, welcome to the worship of the church. And if this morning you come in here carrying a burden of sin, and you're hurting and you're tired, well, welcome. So are we. There is, you know, sometimes we put on pretenses and airs in church, or people think we do. There's nobody here that's perfect except for the one that we celebrate. We are all of us carrying sin, all of us carrying shame, and all of us setting it down and being made free and, and released. And as you go away from here, go away cleansed. You took of the blood this morning, you're washed. You're washed anew every day in the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and, and you're looking for a place to worship, we hope you feel like you found it. We who make our lives here, who are coming here over and over again in church, correct me if I'm lying, but we are blessed with one another. Not because any one of us is so great, but because the God that is at work among us is. We have a wonderful treasure in this church, we who live here. And if you live in this town and you're looking for a place to worship, welcome to the family. Welcome home. And if you're not a Christian, the fact that you came to a Christian worship service says an awful lot about where your heart is. People don't trip and go, oh, I fell into church. You chose to come here. And we are thrilled that you did. And hope that what you're looking for you found. Because whether you know it or not, you have. The greatest thing you'll ever come into contact with is right here. And it may seem kind of dull, and, and you know, you're singing songs you don't know. And trust me, God is worth finding. Even if you've got to plow through some attic to get there. You are in the place of honor, and we are thrilled you're here, and God wants you for Himself. So whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've been through, Welcome to the worship of the Church of Christ. This morning, we're going to begin uh, a, a brief series as we head into Easter. Uh, I grew up not doing an awful lot with Easter. In fact, I was actually an embarrassingly old child when I learned that Easter had anything to do with the resurrection. Uh, in our fellowship, we kind of tend to be anti-holiday you know, I've actually kind of understood the anti-Christmas sentiment that, that was kind of a tradition in our fellowship for a long time because we correctly said, look, the Bible doesn't tell you when that happened. So why are we doing it on December 25th? Who knows? Is it, that doesn't, we don't know when that happened. I kind of understood that. I've never understood this one. Once I learned what it was, I was like, well, why don't we make a big deal about that? That's kind of a big deal, you know? And, you know, what I've heard back from my fellowship is, well, that East, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. And I would say, well, amen. That's right. That's true. Every Sunday is a celebration of the Easter event. Every Sunday we take the supper, we remember the death, but we remember it marked by the rising. It is because He was victorious that people still do this. If He'd stayed in the ground, no one anywhere would do this. But because He is out of the ground, He is host as we do it. And so yes, absolutely, every Sunday is Easter Sunday, but not every Sunday is quite Easter Sunday, is it? You know, it seems to me that there are some traditions that settle around something that make it kind of special. And, and we remember it in a special way, and get ready, that specialness is coming whether you want it or not, because the cute is on its way, man. Because Easter is associated with cute. You know, then when I was growing up, that's all I knew Easter was about, was bunnies and eggs. And I was like, now, wait a minute, those come from chickens, and I don't, what is, I don't, can someone, but you know what, that's what it is. Somehow, bunnies and eggs, they go together, and the cute is coming, man. The cute 
is on its way. It's just adorable, isn't it? It's just so cute, you know? Just, and, then, and even the flowers are singing, which is kind of a little bit of a nightmare, but, you know, the cute is coming. The cute, uh, <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> you know, the thing is, we have no problem with a fat guy in a red suit doing, a, like, thousands of breaking and enterings. Every year, all on one night. We're totally cool with that. But if that thing shows up in your house, then it might eat the head of your children. <laughs> you know? And this is... Oh. Oh. Oh, my. Why? Oh, no. And, and the, the look on her face is like, it's behind me, isn't it? It's the Slender Bunny. <laughs> Slender man. Anyway, and look at the poor kid. He's like, Mommy, why did you do this to me? I'm going to have to talk to Oprah now. <laughs> well, there you go. Happy Easter. Pleasant dreams. If you can sleep after seeing those pictures, you're a much stronger person than I am. I'll be needing some melatonin. But, you know, the thing is, that isn't what Easter's about, is it? That's not what we celebrate. That's what we used to celebrate. And, of course, there's reasons. You know, the egg is about the tomb, and it's empty, you know, because you blew all the stuff out of it, and you painted it with the pretty colors because it's a celebration. Yeah, but you know what? The, what Easter is really about is that. Easter is really about the truth that there is a tomb that ought to have somebody in it that doesn't, you know, or at least a box. Jewish funeral proceedings, what you did is you stuck somebody on a shelf like that and you let them decay. And you let all the juicy parts go away and you'd be left with bones. And then you'd go back after you know six months or so, you'd roll that stone away, you'd go into the tomb and you'd collect it. That's why Joseph of Arimathea is such a big deal that he had a tomb that no one had used before. Because you reuse these places. You use them over and over and again. But a rich man could have one carved out and it's never used before. See, Jesus got buried in clean ground, not unclean ground. And he got stuck in there, and, and, and he was supposed to, what was supposed to happen, he was supposed to rot away. And you go back with a box called an ossuary, and you collect the bones. You put the bones, in the, and then you store that with all the other ossuaries. to will wait for resurrection. That tomb? He didn't use it that long, did he? He had it such a short time and that stone was rolled away and he did something no one else had really done before well I guess Lazarus had he walked out and there was nobody there to call him but the Lord God himself he walked out it's empty and that's what we celebrate Folks, that's what your whole life is built around if you're a Christian, is the great hope that sin and death have been conquered in Jesus Christ and we are free. The tomb is empty. Our Lord is alive and He is with us. Amen? That's right. That's what we celebrate at Easter. But as we head into Easter, it's good to remember what got Him there in the first place. And that was this. Crucifixion is a pretty dreadful way to die. I don't want to get too macabre because, you know, there are a few folks that are kind of younger in here. But I want to go just a little bit into the mechanics. Have you heard these? You may probably have. Why do you die when you're crucified? Well, it's not exposure to the elements. And it's not blood loss, at least generally speaking. The way a crucified person dies is they die in a dreadful death of perpetual movement person doesn't just hang there still. They are constantly in motion because you have to be in motion in order to breathe. You see this person in the, in the thing here. This is a diagram of the skeleton and the muscle, muscles during crucifixion. You'll note that as he hangs there, his body weight is, is holding his chest in an expanded position. He can't exhale if he wants to, except through shallow diaphragmic breathing. Which means that a person who's experiencing crucifixion is constantly in a state somewhere near hyperventilation. They're going... <laughs> little bitty tiny breaths with the diaphragm because the chest is held open. You can't breathe from up here. You have to 
down here. And even down here, you can't breathe much because it's like someone's holding your rib cage out because that's exactly what's happening. Your body weight is. So in order to take a real breath, and eventually you'll have to, because you'll get dizzy and it's, it's horrible. So in order to take a real breath, you have to push against the nails that are through your feet and pull on the nails that are through your wrists in order to get your chest so that it's not expanded anymore so that you can exhale. And then you just collapse back. It is a death of doing pull-ups. Painful pull-ups. Until you die. And you know you're doing them for the rest of your life. You know how uh, there's like often depicted a little seat there? That wasn't to slow, you, slow your death down. It wasn't an act of kindness. It was to, I mean, it wasn't to speed your death up. It was to slow it down. Because it would hold you suspended so that your breath wasn't quite as, your chest wasn't quite as expanded. So there's a little bit more so that you could breathe a little bit more. It would slow down the process. So you had to do the pull-ups that much longer. The way that you eventually died here was suffocation. Oddly enough, your lungs are full of air. It's just that it's all used up. There's not enough oxygen to sustain life, and eventually you simply can't do the pull-up anymore. Although the way our Lord died, suggestive by the piercing of his side, was likely something else. It was likely congestive heart failure, or perhaps even a rupture to his heart. The amount of damage done to his body before he was crucified uh, was so extensive that he went into crucifixion severely disabled. And it's very likely that a lot of fluid built up around his heart uh, just simply because his body was so stressed. And then when he died, it's likely that his, his heart may have actually ruptured because when they pierced him, blood and water came forth from his side. This was a dreadful time for our Lord. And uh, I, I'm sorry if I grieve you with these words. But my purpose in telling you this is not really to talk to you about how the, awful the mechanics are. It's for one specific reason. And that's to talk about what the cost of Jesus talking was. In order to speak, he could not speak in the chest expanded way, at least not if he wanted anybody to hear him. I suspect he could talk a little in the way, but it would come out as a whisper. If he wanted people who were down there on the ground to actually hear what he had to say, it would require one of those pull-ups. He would have to use the nails in order to exhale properly enough for you to be able to speak. Now, remember, those nails are going through his body and very near to significant nerve clusters. So every word that Jesus spoke from the cross, he paid a very high price to speak it to us. He said nothing from up there that was trivial. No words came to us from the cross except those that were absolutely essential for us to hear. Things that were at the very heart of the gospel is what Jesus said. On the cross, Jesus is not only securing our salvation. Obviously, He does. Our redemption is bought there. But that's not all He's doing. He's also teaching us about what it means to truly be human. If we want to know how we should live, then we ought to look sometimes at how He died and specifically what he said to us while he was experiencing it, because those are instructive words. They will lead us to what it means to be really human. After all, this is Jesus' call. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Meaning, come to a life marked by cross, and the way I did it ought to be what your life is about. The way I went to cross is how you go to cross. What happened to me on the cross? Or, of course, at the time he says this, what will happen to me? The way I will do it is the way you should do it always. 
And you're taking up a metaphor. You're taking up a way of life. You're not actually going to be nailed to it. But he was. And what he did informs that metaphor. This is our way of life. The way that he died is the way we should live. Because the the things that are at the very heart of Jesus are the things that are found on the cross. He doesn't speak the trivialities. By the time he's gotten here, everything but the boiled down is, and there's not time for it anymore. He's in the last moments of his life. And he's going to give to us those things that are the most characteristic of who he is and what his way is about. So for the next three weeks, we're going to listen to Jesus on the cross. We're going to hear His words and then we'll celebrate Easter together with Him. This first week, I want us to look at a couple of sayings that have to do with forgiveness. That's one of the title of my sermon. is Jesus on the cross and forgiveness. You remember these words? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What's going on in Jesus' life as he says this? Well, we all know. He was at the board board meeting, and and that that other guy who was kind of out for his job kind of cut in and said a really mean thing, and it undermined him, and, and he had to kind of do some working through it, right? No, no, I'm sorry. They were, they were at the, the family table and crazy Uncle Larry's going off on politics again. And he said that really rude and offensive thing to you that, that made you feel like a bad person because you... No. No, they're driving nails through him at this point. Have you ever had anything that offensive done to you? It's funny the things that we harbor, isn't it? The things that we will hold on to? Oh, some of them aren't funny. Some of them aren't funny at all. There is in this room, if we could see the wounds, if we could just see the wounds in a human soul, we would be an awful lot more gentle with each other. If we could just see what each other is carrying, if we knew the pains... And folks, I'm a minister. That's why I can say that. Because some of you have shown me some of yours. I have seen the bleeding. I have seen the abscesses. And I'll tell you, some of the stories that some of you have told me, I would never dream to say, you know, you should forgive that. Not me. But it comes to you not from me, but from the mouth of God. You should forgive that. Whatever it is. You know, and that's beautiful and easy as long as you leave it in theory. But when it comes to the thing that you're thinking about now because I've been talking about the scarring of your soul, it's not easy and it's not beautiful. It's ugly and it's horrifying because it means setting down justice. It means accepting injustice. It means putting up with the unfairness of it all. That's awful. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What Jesus shows you is what perfect humanity looks like. And perfect humanity is a humanity that forgives. Period. And you think, well, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know what's happened to me. No, you're right, I don't. Was it worse than this? Honestly. I mean, for some of us, it might be on par. Some of us have emotional abuse and scars and things that go for over years and we bear these dreadful burdens and it hurts so bad. Yes, that, that's, and that might be roughly equal to having nails pushed through your hands and through your feet. But was it worse? What Jesus is doing right here is He's forgiving in the moment, immediately. He doesn't wait to work through it. He forgives. He has chosen this posture to be the posture of true humanity. That that His goodness is not dependent upon what someone else does. He's not going to let it be. 
The fact that the crowd around him is evil does not mean that he also will be evil. He will not hold the grudge. He will not hang on to it himself and say, you're murdering me, how dare you? Which is normal human behavior. It's what he ought to do. No, it's not. What we do is not what should be done. This is what should be done. Immediate forgiveness in the moment as it happens. Moment to moment as the pains arise. Because people hurt you, they do. People fail you, they do. You fail yourself. And forgiveness is a way of life for us because it's the way of His death. In the very moment as it happened, He forgave. Had He gone on living for longer than about six hours after this, He would have gone on forgiving for as long as it took. Until it's, it, every time the memory of it came back, comes back, you're in the moment again, you forgive again. Moment in the moment forgiveness is how you release the harms that people have done to you so that they will not harm your soul. So that you might be liberated and free from it. So when your spouse hurts you, and you know good and well that they know what they're doing, ask yourself if they were in a good place, would they be doing that? And they don't know what they're doing. And you forgive in the moment, and you ascribe to them their goodness that they don't deserve. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's treating His his accusers, His attackers, His murderers as people. People that He wants to love. Now, how on earth do we do that? How do I forgive someone when they're doing atrocious things to me? How do I forgive the person who 30 years ago did an atrocious thing to me? Let me ask you, how is he doing it? Look at those words, and what are they? Those words are a prayer. They are a prayer from the cross. And Jesus finds his way to forgive those people who are currently murdering him, taunting him while he dies, mocking him spitting on him. How does he forgive? He prays for them. I tell you, when Jesus said, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he wasn't kidding. The people who have wronged you, if you want to be free from their wrong, you pray for them. Jesus meant it when he taught it, and he taught it as he died. To be free from the wrongs of this world, We forgive, and we forgive by praying. We pray God's forgiveness upon our enemies, and God will empower us also to love and forgive our enemies. It's how He did it. It's how His disciples do it. Now folks, I'm not saying it's easy. This is in no ways simple. And you may have to say a longer prayer than than that short one in order to be free. You may have to pray for years to be free. But you follow His example in His death and you die to yourself by doing it. Because love requires forgiveness. And if you're going to be a person who loves, you've got to develop the skill. Jesus is teaching us to forgive. Another amazing word from Jesus. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, why do I tie this one together with the previous one? Because it also is about forgiveness. And at the moment, forgiveness. You know, you think about what was going on. The two, th- uh, two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus are, are mocking him. But one of them comes to his senses and yells at the other one, don't, don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserve. But this man hadn't done anything. And then... He looks a little further over. He's looking past Jesus, and he looks to see Jesus. And he says the most unbelievably faithful thing, (laughs) this shockingly faithful, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What kingdom? They're both dying. You know, they're both going to be dead in less than 10 hours. 
The sun will go down soon, and the Jews are not going to put up with the crucifixion heading into Pascha, heading into Passover. They're not going to put up with it. So their legs are going to get broken. They know it. They're going to be dead very, very soon. What kingdom? What kingdom is he thinking of? Somehow this man saw in Jesus a king that was greater than Herod, a king greater than Pilate, a king greater than, and a kingdom greater than Rome or Judea. Somehow this man realized, okay, this man's dying for his kingdom. That must mean that his kingdom is a kingdom that's beyond death. So if I die with him, maybe I'll be all right. And remember, this is not your upstanding citizen. This is not your good Jew. This is your bad Jew. This is the bad guy, the refuse, the garbage, the one that gets the label sinners thrown onto it. That's who he is. He even says, hey, we're dying fair. He's not. It's not fair for him, but it's fair for us. We deserve what we've got. And yet somehow he thinks maybe he can still be included. How can he possibly still be included? He doesn't deserve it. And this is the truth that comes washing over him and over us. Deserves got nothing to do with it. Your forgiveness isn't because you deserve it. God has not forgiven you because you earned it. God has not forgiven you because you did the right things the right way for the right reasons, and yeah, He owes it to me. Well, if you're approaching things that way, you're approaching things very brokenly, and you haven't understood the heart of your Father or of your Master. Because Jesus didn't look at that man and assess him and go and say, well, yeah, I guess you were good enough. Jesus looked at that man and said, you want what I have to offer. You are forgiven. Your slate is clean. You're washed. If you and I could get down off of here, we'd go to a river somewhere. You'd celebrate that. But I have forgiven you. Now what does this have to do? Well, this has to do with why you must forgive it all. Because this is the heart of your God. This is the nature of your God. Your God is good and forgiving and loving. And He calls you to be like Him. Following Jesus means taking on His nature. The nature of a God who doesn't sit around and wait for people to be good enough before He starts loving them. He loves them in the middle of their refuse. In the middle of their brokenness. Yeah, He loves them too much to leave them there. But He loves them where they are, just like He loves you where you are. And He loves you too much to leave you there either. Intends to lead you out of it. To bring you to a better place. And He calls you to love people who are, whose lives are a mess. Who are broken. Who don't deserve it. Deserves got nothing to do with being a follower of Jesus, folks. You love people because they're people. You're good to people because they breathe. You welcome people with all of their messiness, all of their sins, all of their estrangements, all of their brokenness, all of the mess. And you say, come to me. I will love you. Not because I'm amazing, but because I follow a Master who is. And He showed me that. He showed me that people who aren't worth it are worth it. That people who don't deserve it deserve it. The people who can't earn it, get it. People who aren't welcome are welcomed into paradise itself. And since He did this, so also we must invite them into our lives. Not that our lives are paradise, but maybe if we follow Jesus, it can be an echo of it. You see, Jesus calls us to be people who are forgiving. And not only is your forgiveness secured on the cross, but upon the cross of Jesus you are most powerfully taught to forgive. Put this idea in front of you that Jesus was forgiving as He was dying. Not, just, not only did His death secure forgiveness, but while it was happening, He Himself was a forgiving person. He forgave the thief. 
and he forgave his killers. He was at his heart a forgiving man. And he is teaching you to be a forgiving person as he dies. So shall you live. He is teaching you to be good. Teaching you to let it go, whatever it is. Teaching you to set it down and not harbor it but instead to extend love. Because love can only exist in an environment of forgiveness. If you do not forgive, your grudge is corrosive to your love. If you do not forgive, you will lose sight of your Christian life. The thing that you hold on to will become a treasure that's too good for you to set down. It's too important to you. And it will get in the way of loving the person against whom you hold that grudge. But you weren't called to be righteous. At least not the way a lot of us know that word. You were called to be righteous as loving. What are God's great commandments? Love God. Love your neighbor. And who is your neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. So you're called to love everybody. Why? Because that's who God is. It's what He does. And you're supposed to bear His image. And love forgives. And think about it. The people that you most cherish, isn't it possible for you to let go of things a little more easily and especially the more that you cherish them. The more that you love somebody, the easier it is to forgive. You realize that the opposite is also true. The more that you forgive, the easier it becomes to love. And love, folks, is what we're made for. It's our purpose. Jesus on the cross taught forgiveness because it is at the heart of human existence. We are expected to be people that love. How are you doing with this? I realize how difficult something like this is, especially if you have significant wounds. But I ask again, how are you doing? Are you doing anything with this? Is your grudge more important than your gospel? Is your pain more pleasing than your Savior? Christ calls to you from the cross. Let it go. And if you need help, the Lord Jesus has provided His church. And we will listen to you. We will talk with you. We will counsel with you. Whatever you need. And goodness knows we will pray for you. And remember that forgiveness is born of prayer. If you need the prayers of the saints, we want to pray for you. And if you came into this place carrying something that has nothing to do with what I've talked about today, but you need our prayers, well, this God's people want to lift you to God. We we would love the opportunity to pray for you. And if you came here today and you're not a Christian, look, there's water right here. You can be clean. You can be washed. You can begin your walk with Jesus by dying with Him and coming back to life just like He did. You can do that. And we'll wait on lunch. It hasn't been a long sermon after all. If you're subject this morning to the invitation of God, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing? First of the kingdom of God.